welcome back to Pacific Association of First Nations Women's Indigenous History Forum, Truth Telling. Our next beautiful guest is from the uh, Table Tooth Nation. Her name is Carlene Thomas. Uh, she's a Special Projects Manager for the Treaty Lands and Resources Department of the Sable Tooth Nation. Uh, Ms. Thomas works on building relationships with communities and various government entities encompassed with, within the homelands of the, and the waters of the Tsewa Tooth Nation. In the recent past, she worked on a sacred trust initiative for the TWN's opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline and Expansion Project. Ms. Thomas currently works, sits on the Wild Bird Trust of the BC Board of Directors in Burnaby, the school district, uh, the Aboriginal Education Advisory. Carlene is most proud of being married to David Thomas Sr. for 36 years until his untimely but peaceful passing in September of 2019. She's also a proud mother of three and grandmother of four granddaughters and one grandson. So we welcome Carlene Thomas. Thank you. So stand here. Yeah. All right. Oh, so what I said to you in the very teeny tiny bit of my language that I know called Hankamitnam, I said, my respected ones, the feelings I have are so good to see you and to be with you here today. This is like my first event with real live people, so this is really exciting. <laughs> yeah. And in Coast Salish way, I introduced myself to you with my ancestral name, I carry the name Ansakhalot. It was given to me by my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, when I was a much younger woman. And it was when she found, she found the name, because it was lost. And she went through some, did research and went through some kind of written records. She found the name, presented it to her two eldest aunties, and they said, oh no, dear, you, you have it. You found it, you have it. And it's my five times great-grandmother's name, and it comes from here, this village of Snuck. So I'm very, it always feels like home when I come here, and I didn't really know why until she explained that to me. And in Coast Salish way, I also share a little bit of my family tree. We do that for many reasons, but the most important it informs the audience that I know who I am. I know where I come from. And as a Wamokta, as a grandmother, I carry that responsibility a lot more dearly these days. So my parents are Deanna George and the late hereditary chief, Ernie, or Iggy, as George, as he was known to his friends. My father um, passed away in November from two, long, hard years battling cancer. So it is a little bit rough still, but uh, we know he's not suffering. Both sets of my grandparents have passed on a while ago. My paternal grandparents are the late hereditary chief, John L. George, and in the circle of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, he was called the Right Honorable. Mm -hmm. And that was because when they were going to meet then Prime Minister Trudeau, that they were told how to address him. And my grandfather, without skipping a beat, said, well, he can call me right honorable as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and my grandmother is the late Lillian or Dolly George, and she was very active in the um, Indian Homemakers Association, which was an auxiliary to the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. So, the Indian homemakers of BC ensured that social services were provided, especially to the most rural communities that didn't have the access that urban communities did. 
and my late paternal grandparents. And for a real long time, I never acknowledged them when I did this kind of work. And it really bothered me, I guess, especially when I became a grandmother, because, you know, my grands are really important. And why wouldn't I acknowledge my maternal grandparents? And I figured out, I came to the conclusion that, you know, during that time of colonization and where all the Indians were put on reserves and, and you know, a border around them, basically, and they weren't allowed to leave reserves without permission, it split, it broke families apart and it set us against each other and we forgot. We got into that survival mode and we forgot who about our relations. So with great respect and honor, I acknowledge my maternal grandparents as the late Stan Joseph from the Squamish Nation and the late Caroline Nee Thomas Nee Joseph Nee Trimble from Snanemo, from Nanaimo, and from Kincolith, from a beautiful little village up in the Nass Valley, the Niskat people. Raising my hands, it's a gesture of welcome. Hi, it's Sepka. Amit Sepwitwilam, I'm welcoming you here to the homelands and waters of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Another thing, what I was getting into there, you know, when we, when our relationships got disrupted like that, it's taken a long time, so a lot of, in my own humble view, a lot of nations, Indian tribes, Indian bands, whatever they want to call us these days, we have reconciling of our relationships too. We have to do that work. And Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh are doing a pretty good job. And you know what kind of got us together was the um, possibility of losing out on some crown land if we didn't get our act together and say, yeah, let's work together. That's something my grandfather always taught me though. We have to work together. So I'm here today to share a little bit of um, our history, and uh, I have a PowerPoint. There's some archival family photos in there, and there's some current photos, and it's just a little brief. With, I like to call it TWN 101. Uh, our team calls it the uh, Slow to the Nation Backgrounder. So the front photo we have here is my late Uncle Herb, my one of my dad's younger brothers. He was <clears throat> highlighted in a book called Living Proof. Uh, Terry Tobias, I think it was, was the author, and he had published Chief Carey's Moose, and it was talking about how Indian, or how indigenous peoples um, relate to or how they feel about maps. Because like I told you earlier, we're put onto a reserve and a line drawn around us, etc. So it wasn't really a good relationship. But this man did a pretty good job. When he heard my Uncle Herb's story, he asked if he could be a chapter of that book called Living Proof. Next please. Oh wait, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to tell you. That's my Uncle Herb in the Indian River Valley, at the Indian River. That's his dog, Jubilee. And down here is a spent out salmon. And I guess Uncle was trying to keep Jubilee away from that, because you know what dogs like to do with smelly stuff. They love to roll around in it. Next. So, Slewatuth, Slewatuth means people of the inlet. And it refers directly to the Burrard Inlet all the way up here, the Indian arm, including the Indian River. And we've been taught that we've been here since time out of mind. You know, I'm 60 years old yet, and I never asked, what does time out of mind? Because you know, out there, people say time immemorial. So I think when we use the word time out of mind, it's from the oldest living memory that we know our people have been here. Pre-colonization, our population was in the tens of thousands, and with the pandemics of smallpox that came through over time, our population was decimated into, our oral history tells us, a handful. 
And we know that it was very, very small because when they came in to put us on Indian reserves, the reserve was based on how many male heads of households there were. So in other oral history, they say 13. So we had 13 families left. So my reserve is on the Dollarton Highway in North Vancouver, one square mile by one square mile. This uh, map was actually a map based on our oral history. In the early 90s, they, um, the province and the feds got together and decided that there should be a BC treaty process. Uh, Slewatut took the, till the very last day, almost the last minute, to submit to say that we would, we would participate. It was where we felt we're between a rock and a hard place because we're a small enough Indian band at that time, as it was, surrounded by the Squamish and the Musqueam who were, you know, trying to claim us. And we decided to follow our great-grandfather's advice. In 1923, when the Squamish Nation amalgamated all their tribes, uh, my grandfather, my great-grandfather stood strong and said no. If Slaweta does that, we will lose our voice. So we've been brought up as Slawa people to make sure we use our voice whenever we can. So this map that we had to submit to the BC treaty process was based on that oral tradition. So from the north arm of the Fraser River to Point Grey over to Point Atkinson, slope into the foothills of Mount Garibaldi, and follow the Coquitlam watershed down here. And that's what our great-grandfather had told my grandfather, who told my dad what he told all of us. Next, please. I included this slide because, I think it, can some of this disappear down the bottom? There might be some slide, some pieces missing of the map. Um, so, Another thing that Slavotip does is we, we build relationships because we're such a small First Nation. We know we can't do the work ourselves. We need people to work with us. We have a pretty good relationship with the archaeology department at Simon Fraser University and we've done a number of field schools throughout our homelands and waters. I refuse to use the word territories. That's my own personal choice because doing a lot of this work and, you know, speaking to a lot of Klinitam, non-native people, you know, they get, they clench. They get uptight when you say territories. And being a teacher, I want people to have an open mind and an open heart when they're listening to me because I'm sharing my history. And I want them to hear that and not feel all hot and bothered that, you know, I might be accusing them of something, which I'm not. Anyway, so we've done a really good job working with, with Simon Fraser. Uh, one of the, oh, you can't see it. One of the, um, oh, it's not even on here. So the latest field school we did was at the Barnett Marine Park in Burnaby. And the protocol, the process is when we do these field schools is that there is a blessing of the ground, blessing of the place. And when the school gets started, we bring our elders and our knowledge keepers on site so that they, the students will get to know who we are and that the people are still here. The people they are researching are still here. And this site is very important to me because it really reflected how important oral history is and how significant that is, and that institutes like Simon Fraser University need to hear that firsthand. So we were there, the lead archeologist was there. He was telling my parents, he was telling our elder um, knowledge keepers, you know, what they were finding, and like there was just tons of shell, clam shells. So we know that was one of the clam shell, clam processing villages. 
And in this site, they also found what he called a berry processing oven. I wish I took a photo of it. I didn't take a photo of it. I could not see how he could call it an oven. But he also said that the residue of the berries on the oven were elderberry, the red elderberry. And he went on about things and he was kind of feeling kind of bummed out that there wasn't any huge, I don't know, I guess stone implements or any, you know, fancy big, big items. And I said, no, this site is a grandmother site. And let me tell you why. So when I was a kid, my grand would come into our elementary school. So this is in the 60s. Uh, there was a really progressive Quinitum teacher that made really good friends with my grand. She'd invite it, her in when they're talking about, in the curriculum, when they're talking about the Indians. And my grand would come in and talk about the Slavitith people. And she'd start off by saying, you know, our people would go out and gather berries and they'd process them. Then they lay them out to dry, and when it was dry, they'd roll them up, put them away for the winter. So in actuality, we invented the first fruit roll-up. Yeah. <laughs> and back then, you know, fruit roll-ups were just becoming a thing. And everybody have a good laugh. And, and so when I told him that, you know, that he felt better that they understand how important our oral history is. And they say that site is between 2,500 and 4,000 years old. Imagine that. Imagine that. Blows my mind every time I think of it. We have a number of other um, recorded, obviously these are recorded at, in the archaeology um, ministry of a number of our villages. So around here where it says RR number six, that's Belcara. And in Belcara, we called it Pumt Melton. Tum Tamelchten means biggest place for the people. So come winter time, all of our people would come here. And you can see it's a bay. It's protected by the, from the weather elements. It's also protected, our, our warriors could come down and go on the point and see if any of our enemies were coming up the inlet. So that's a very important place. Next slide. And when winter, oh, oh, okay, so I switched the slides around. So as I shared earlier, you know, we've been brought up to, to really be, to really build those relationships in order for us to, to survive. We also were brought up with that sacred obligation, that shahalmas. It's our obligation to protect our homelands and waters. These photos are of my ancestors. So this gentleman standing right here is my maternal great-great-grandfather, Joseph Thomas. And he is near a dugout canoe, and he's carrying a rifle. He was actually being a guide for a power company in the Indian River Valley. They were looking for a way to bring hydroelectricity through the Indian River Valley, and they hired him as a guide. This gentleman down here in the dugout canoe is my paternal grandfather, um, my birth paternal grandfather, Ernie George I. And he is in a dugout canoe in the Indian River and they're up there fishing. A beautiful story my dad shared with me when I first started doing this work. He said he remembered he was about eight years old and has no idea why, but he was the only one with his mom and dad up the river that time. And they were fishing, either pink or chum, whatever was running. And they came, they were coming home and they came upon a snag in the river. And so my grandfather tells my grandmother, she was in the bow of the canoe, he says, okay, when I tell you, you jump. And so they come up on the snag and he says, jump. My grand jumps over my dad, the fish, the nets and lands in the back of the canoe with him and then she had to jump back when they got over the snake just so they could get over the snake. Now when my dad was telling me this my gran was got to be in her 60s so I'm imagining my gran at 60 years old doing this 
when in reality she was probably just in her late 20s and probably as uh, sprite as a deer. <laughs> Next slide. We also talk about our connectedness to our homelands and waters that, um, and we know that when our homelands and waters are healthy, our communities are healthy. So Slavotov has worked really hard to ensure that the work we do is helping to restore habitat, we're helping to protect habitat. And this photo is uh, the same day that my uncle was up the river with Terry and he's just harvesting some salmon berries. I'm sure he's wondering, not even sharing any, I'm sure. <laughs> this uh, logo down here is the logo that Damien George Sr. Still Austin created for then, I think it was Chief <coughs> Leonard George. We started a <coughs> protocol agreement with the District of North Vancouver at Cates Park. They call it Cates Park, we've called it Poyawichin, and it was one of our summer villages. So his, to him, the, the park represents the, the deer and, and the ravens. Next slide, please. As I shared earlier, we lived in seasonal rounds, so we would be here at Balcara in the winter, and when spring broke, you know, you're living with your relatives for what, three, four months in a closed quarters, it's great to get out. So our people would spread around all of the Burrard Inlet to our spring summer camps and start that round of harvesting and preserving for the winter that's coming up. In the summer, we would journey to the Fraser River to harvest sockeye, because our little Indian River is, isn't big enough to harvest sockeye or Chinook. And in the autumn, we'd go back up to the Indian River to harvest um, chum or pink, whatever run is happening that year. We'd also hunt. We've actually reintroduced elk into the Indian River Valley, I believe it was 2005. We had a, a, a herd of about 27 elk, and now there's an, a couple of herds. They've grown so over 80 at least, so they've broken into smaller herds. And yeah, next slide. Uh, one of the teachings that we've always had when the tide went out, the table was set. So where I live right now on the Dalton Highway, it's a beautiful mud flats. Unfortunately, we can no longer harvest clams or oysters or mussels um, because of the constant, consistent pollution. It, 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 they're toxic. They're not good for human consumption. This photo was actually me and my grand. Uh, you know, my, my, um, my grandparents just had boys and just two of the sons had families. So out of two sons, they've had 11 grandchildren. And, you know, more often than not in the summer, there was like six of us, seven of us hanging out at my grand. So she would take us down the mud flats and teach us how to dig clams and catch crab. And I refused to learn how to catch crab, because then you had to use your feet. She was teaching us how to use our feet, and I, all I could imagine was these angry crabs uh, in their pinchers, you know, catching my toes. So I hope my, my brothers or my sisters learned how. I didn't, but I know how to crab, clam. Unfortunately, we can't clam in our, on our mud flats anymore, but Slautoth has been working with, um, I don't think we're working with anybody. We're doing it on our own. We found a place in the inlet that is, for the most part, really safe to harvest clams. So over the last five, six years, I think we've only been able to harvest it three or four times. And um, just because of the toxicity. Of course, it's not the favorite clam that we all love to eat. I can't remember what species it is, but we're grateful. and we because it's not enough to you know, process and put away for the winter, we just have a big feast. And this is um, my late uncle Alfred, my, one of my grandfather's older brothers. And this photo was probably taken in the 70s or the 80s, and it's him down on the, on the mud flats uh, going to harvesting for some clams. Next, please. 
So when we got into the tree process, we had to figure out what we're doing. And what we did was we hired and trained some of our own youth at the time to do write research questions and how to do interview with video and audio. And, and then we had another young fellow who was really into the GIS, Geographical Information System. So building maps. And this is one of the first maps that was created from the traditional youth study that, I think we had four or five youth of the time doing this. I say youth of the time because it was my sister, Chief Leah George Wilson, my cousin brother, Justin George, Damien George, yeah, they were all, they were all in it. They did a really good job. So all of these orangey circles are just um, information data that, uh, they interviewed anybody who wanted to be interviewed about where in the inlet or where on our homelands and waters that they harvested, hunted, trapped, fished, all that kind of stuff. What was really important, what was really interesting to me is that I didn't know our people ate octopus, but it would make total sense because it's right there. The other one, my grand tells me a story about the sea urchin. I've never been able to eat sea urchin. I never had the desire to go out and eat sea urchin, and it probably disappeared after my grandparents' generation. And she said they would go to, you know, at the, at the mouth of a, a creek, a river, um, so like Seymour River is where they would go and harvest it, and they would just, they didn't process it, they didn't cook it. She said they'd just flip it over, stick their thumb in, and go, and there, that was that was their food. But the important thing was to return the shells back to where you harvested them. And when they disappeared, you know, my grand, she's really funny. She says, oh, it was your uncles, they didn't return it back. So the sea urchin <laughs> never came back. So yeah, this was the very first uh, uh, GIS map that our, our folks did. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Em. <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, one of the other things that we had to do in our fight against Kinder Morgan, you know, it, it's just really, <sighs> don't want to use a bad word here, <laughs> frustrating. It's, it's really disgusting what Indigenous people have to do to prove that we've been here. And they even put an arbitrary date. So we had to prove to the government that Slavoteth has been here since 1863 or something like that. I can't remember what the date was. So because we don't have our own anthropologist or archeologist or somebody who could write, we hire those kinds of people. Uh, Jesse Morin was the one who worked with us to create our research we needed to submit our, to submit to the NEB or whoever else needed to try and understand why Slayoteth was opposing this expansion. And one of the, but we also use it for our treaty information too. Um, so this one, specific one, is a map of, um, it talks about Hals, so in Coast Salish, um, would you say mythology? I don't know if I'd use the word mythology, but in our, in our history, in our oral tellings, Hals is a, is a transformer. He traveled around Coast Salish territories and lots of First Nations have stories about what Hals did in their territory. One of the things that happened to be here was this two-headed serpent. So here is Belkera from Tamehutin, and here's the two-headed serpent in our oral history. And he had cut off the fresh water supply to our village here. And so the story goes that one of our young men trained himself, some say for seven years, some say for a year, some say for months. But the point is this young man was trained 
to slay this serpent. And when it came time for him to slay the serpent, um, he took one of the fangs and he struck a rock at Belcara. And to this day, well, I don't know to this day, but in the 1990s, water, fresh water still comes from that rock. I started work as a teacher aide, so yeah, it was in the 80s, in our school district. And I guess we had about a dozen kids in the high school. And I told them this story and you know how kids are, yeah, right, whatever. So I phoned up my Uncle Herb. I said, hey, Uncle, I was telling the kids about uh, Sanathkwe. Can you, can you bring us to Tum Tum to, to see it? And he said, yeah, sure. So we hop in the school bus, which is a 15 passenger van, and we take the kids out there. And unfortunately, the rock is on a place, on a private property right now, so we couldn't go there, but we could see it from the dock. So, yeah. Um, and what, what Jesse also did was did a study of rock paintings. So at a number of points in the inlet, they have found uh, pictographs or rock paintings of, of Sanathkwe, which is two-headed, the, the snake. Next slide. Um, so, like many other First Nations, the impact of contact and development has been brutal. Not only did they remove us from our villages, but they also removed us and made sure we didn't get to participate in the economy on, a, on an equitable basis. So where I live, on the North Shore, my grandfather and his brothers, his brothers-in-law and his nephews, uh, got into logging. So I determined that they did selective logging before selective logging became a thing. They would take contracts and they would do, do logging because they had to find a way to put food on the table for their families. So right here is my grandfather, Ernie. This is their brother-in-law, Mr. Ange. I can't remember if it's Oliver or the other one. This one is their brother-in-law, Andrew Jack who came from Seashell and married their oldest sister. And this one here is the late great Chief Dan. And this is one of the trees that they had taken down by hand. So they used those two man saws and what have you. I've included this photo from the archives of North Vancouver just to get a real sense of how huge these trees were. And you know, right now, maybe when my grand grandfather said it was probably a second growth, or I don't know that it would be a first growth. But yeah, so that's what our, our people did. My ta'a, my great grandma, and her, one of her older sons, no, younger sons, they um, went into partnership with a Juanita man, I can't remember his name, and they built a shake mill down on her beach. And if you, if you take in that which sustains us, uh, the exhibit that's here, you'll see, I took a photo of it and took um, what's left of some of the, the shake mill. Next slide. And I'm sure you're all aware of the impacts of that colonization. Uh, one of the things I like to tell children, especially students, when I talk to them, because it just becomes kind of like common verbiage that we lost our languages. And I tell them, no. Your languages were stolen. Your ancestors were beaten, tortured, forced to never speak their language again. Imagine that in a beautiful country called Canada. That's what happened. They used the residential schools to ensure that the Indian and the child would be killed. That assimilation would become complete. But we survived. And why did we survive? I don't have a straight answer for you. I have many answers. I can think of many reasons, but the most important I think is that um, 
the gift, the strength, the teaching we have as Huamok people is really how to be family, how to be community, and how to govern that in such a way that it is fair and equitable. No one is above anyone else. Everybody has their basic human rights and needs filled. That's just my opinion. Um, voting. I don't know if you've heard, but in Indian people in Canada couldn't vote until 1960, the year I was born. Imagine that. And of course, the prohibition of spiritual practices. Um, we were all taught that it was evil, it was the devil, and now look what's happened. There's been a fine, there's been a number, from my observation, there's been a, a number of um, renaissance, a rejuvenating of that. I'm so grateful to the elders, to those who have passed on, that we're able to hold on to that, and that we're able to share, that we're building that. My own son was initiated about six years ago, and it just, did amazing things for our family, for him specifically, but for our family as well. This photo is some of our Thomas, where the Thomas name comes from. This is Frank Thomas, his little brother Denny Thomas, their older, oldest sister Emma Thomas. She became a Joe, she married the Joe in, in Squamish Nation. And they're at the family cabin up the Indian River, and obviously they're up there going to hunt and prepare for the winter. Next slide, please. Um, you know, Indigenous communities all across Canada face really serious challenges, but now it's, those aren't just our challenges. They're the challenges of, the, of the, every Canadian citizen. You know, when I think about the dire straits that our sockeye salmon in, is in right now and nobody out there is doing anything. Well, I don't want to say on the government side, doing anything to preserve and protect that species. And, and I guess it's so heartfelt to me because that's all I grew up on. Like I didn't even grow up on the chum and the pink like my late husband did. We had the sockeye and the chinook halibut um, but we're all, we're all up against that. And some of the questions that we ask here and ask our audiences is how do, can we move forward? How can we protect Sowetith rights and interests? And how do we act? Next slide. So what we've been brought up is to be not, not to be paralyzed by anger and to be bitter about that. Because I would sit up, I'm really lucky I get to live in my late grandparents' home. We'd sit at the dinner table, look out the front window, we'd see the Burrard Inlet, Capitol Hill and Burnaby, Burnaby Mountain and the city of Vancouver, and my grandfather would say, they're not going anywhere, we're not going anywhere. We have to find a way to coexist. Doesn't mean our ways are better or their ways are better, we have to find a way to work together. And that's what Slavitith does. We work really hard to build those relationships because we know we can't do the work on our own, but we need people to believe in what our vision is, what we want to see happening and how we can protect the lands and waters of Vancouver. Um, so when we got into the treaty process, we're meeting in boardrooms, at boardroom tables, in ballrooms, at conference tables, and we're getting the sense that we're beating our head against a brick wall because the negotiators weren't understanding where we're coming from. So we decided to put them in trucks and boats and we took them up the Indian River. And this is where my dad shared his teachings, his stories, the history of Slauteth, in this area with the provincial and federal negotiators. I'm sure he's standing at one of the deep holes where we would catch salmon. Next slide, please. Um, so our goals, our vision, is to really get to that government-to-government -government relationship. 
because we can no longer stand in the shadows or sit in the back and bear the brunt of government decision-making because it's never with our interests in mind. So we need to get there. We need equity. I always talk about equity because it's not to say we will, we're going to take away from other Canadian citizens. We want to be at, at an equal place. We're down here. Canadian citizens, even immigrants are above us. Nothing against immigrants. Because they're escaping a country to come to another country that embraces them. They need to understand how Canada does not embrace its own indigenous peoples. So these photos are of some of the projects that we've done in the past, and we still continue to do. This is Henry George from the Slavitic Nation. Right now, or this was in the 2000s, we are doing a water quality study of the Burrard Inlet. So our crew went to 16 different places all around the inlet collecting samples and just figuring out the state of the water in our inlet. This photo down here, when the fish were very um, plentiful in the Indian River, we worked with D DFO and they would come and take, they would call it, they were called egg takes. So they would take eggs and the sperm of the chum or the pink and they'd take that and help to help repopulate other fish bearing streams that were in trouble. We've had a couple of serious flash floods in the river, so it's destroyed quite a bit of habitat, so we're working to restore that habitat. We've told DFO, nope, you can't come back, and of course, all the stream keepers and fish loving people are really upset about it, but you know, we have to protect, right? And then this down here is our late Uncle Bob, George, who, who was granted um, a doctorate from BCIT, he was one of the first elders that were elders in residence at an institute. And they just loved him there. They gave him this doctorate. <laughs> he is the oldest son of Chief Dan George. And he's sitting here with Carrie Chambers, our um, elders coordinator at the time. And we had just completed our Sinequium protocol. And so she was just uh, our, our management uh, protocol agreement. So he, she was just explaining to them him. Next slide. I think we're just about done, actually. And I told you about partnerships and relationships. So at Cates Park, we ha with the District of North Van, we have a protocol agreement. We actually have a protocol agreement here with the Vancouver Museum. We have one for the Museum of North Vancouver. I'm sure we have other protocol agreements. I just can't think of them right now. This actually was maybe in the early 2000s. This is my sister, Leah, who was chief at that time. Went to school, got her law degree, came back, and she was chief until a few days ago. She decided not to run. She's going for her master's in law, and she needs to, uh, she needs a job. So she's got to finish. What did she say? You know, when you're on council, and especially in a small community, it's not a paid job. So you have a full-time job plus job of governance in your community. And right now, things are getting too busy at their law firm. Um, the realization of some of our goals, so here, uh, we opened up our our uh, child and family development center. I need to get a I need to get a comparison photo. This little guy here is the so Henry. He said on the in the last slide. This is his oldest son, Tyler, who's like two or three years old, and right now he's like fifteen. So and these two are still there. Dean manages runs our day, our daycare. I call it daycare preschool. Is, uh, does the infant toddlers, and Leanna has moved from there. She's moved to education, and now she's moved to CLR. I need to get a comparison photo. <laughs> and we have our supplier tours, which is an ecotourism company. We never make money on it, but that's not the purpose. We need to get, we need some people out in the canoe, 
learning about Silocus firsthand on the water. And of course, our Safe the Trust initiative, uh, we started that in 2012. We had the Reuben George came to the Council of the Day and said, you know, shared everything he knew about this project. So we sent him away and said, you know, you figure out the pros and the cons and you come back. We gathered the community together, had a feast. And at the end, council said, okay, um, family, what do you want us to do? And it was a resounding 100% no, we need to stop this project. So we've always reached out to the community to ensure that we're taking the right road. It costs a lot of money to go to the court. We have some allies that have helped meet some of the costs, but still. This photo was taken at one of our very first, well, only tribal journey we had. We worked with the Spamish Nation, and we traveled from... Ambleside Park to Cape Park, and on the way, we stopped in front of the, uh, the terminal at Westbridge and Burnaby, and we held our first water ceremony that in living memory that we could ever recall. We had some medicine people on the canoe, and they had that. It was, I was really kind of jealous because I couldn't be out there, but my son and his wife were out there. I had the granddaughter with me on the beach. And just, you know, what I've been saying to you all day is how important it is to build those relationships. You know, we take 10 steps forward and about five steps back, but, you know, we, we can't give up. It's not in our DNA to give up. So, five steps back and to all of you. I have to share, when I showed my uncle um, this, uh, this PowerPoint, he said, hey, I took that picture. I said, yeah, I know. Thank you. Thanks so much for allowing us to use it. He goes, you know, you know what it is, right? And I said, yeah, it's up at the river, up at Indian River. Yeah, that's the School of Salmon. It was really awesome. So whenever I see that, I think no matter how huge this city gets, no matter how hot this city gets, no matter what's going wrong, Really awesome to know that cycle salmon is still continuing. Are there any developments? Well, I do. Thank you for the question because I keep forgetting I should put in something about our economic development. I'm not well versed on our economic development. On our reserve, we are building market retail housing. No getting around that, that's kind of like a, um, the only kind of revenue we can raise on our reserve. We have worked with Musqueam and Squamish on a number of different lands here in the city. So it's because of the Dugamu case, the Haida Taku case, that government can't just dispose of land willy-nilly. They have to go to the First Nations where that land is for the um, kind of like first right to refusal. So we do have some lands called the Jericho land. We're working with Musqueam and Squamish on that. And then there are a couple of other pieces of land that um, I can't think of right off the top of my head. Because either Musqueam is with us or Squamish is with us. Not all three are together. We have to buy those lands back though, which is really unfortunate number of people are not happy about it, but if we didn't do that, the government could turn around and sell it to someone else. So it's still not right, but if we don't, again, we're between a rock and a hard place and we're thinking about our future, this will help us. Yes, they call that the Heather Street Land. We, right now, we, <clears throat> we tried to revive the hunk of meat We had a little um, guest project, and then we went as far as we could because we don't have fluent speakers in our community. We kind of switched over to Squamish for a little while because there are, they have more fluent speakers there. And yeah, so we kind of partner with them, but I think 
we're going to find a way to try and get back to how to meet them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at the top of Indian River, I forgot to point that out, there is a reserve, but it's pretty much washed out now because of those floods. So we had, you know, a number of family cabins. We had a number of uh, smoke houses. How we prepared that even the peak, we, we smoked them. Oh, right. Yeah, so on our registry, we have, I think it's close to 600 now. I thought we were like the tiniest little coastalist reserve, but there are others smaller than us. Are there ways to improve? Oh, yeah. Um, good question, because I totally forgot. We have a youth council. So about four years ago, um, some youth got together and, and asked the youth council to formally appoint, not appoint, they... They have their own style of elections, so uh, I honestly can't remember how many are on that council, but yeah, we have a youth council. So this year I said, hey, I think we need an elders council. <laughs> you know, my grandpa was part of the union, right? So I was against it as well, but our community decided that if we didn't get our foot in the door, where would that leave us? Because, you know, at that time, we were just, you know, over 300 people. So we thought, you know, we keep, we kind of keep our foot in both camps. Um, you know, and, that, and the treaty process right now. And actually, I remember talking to Sophie Pierre, who was the commissioner back then. And, you know, I told her one of my biggest hate about the treaty process is that we have to borrow that money. So every, all this good work that you see on this, in this PowerPoint is because we got in the treaty process. We turned around and used that money to build capacity, to build our arch archival, you know, our research and all that kind of information. And uh, she kind of whispered, we don't worry, we won't have to. So I was okay. And now we've come, I think this past year, the government has forgiven all loans. But I don't know what that means. Maybe they'll take it out of us at the end. I don't know. I don't trust it, but, you know, at least it keeps them at the table. At least some First Nations have been able to work through it. But, I mean, it's been over 30 years since the process has happened. And, you know, Sewatip has done a lot of good work without having that treaty. We built some really good relationships. You know, the city of Vancouver is okay. Um, I believe it's just shy of 600. I believe all that we could find. So I think Jesse was able to publish that. I apologize. I don't know what journal it is. Um, but if you Google Jesse Morin, J E S S E M O R I N, you'll be able to. <laughs> Oh, good question. So a thing I forgot to mention in the PowerPoint is Indian Arm Park, what the province calls Indian Arm Park, we call Sinusquam. And that was when um, Harcourt was premier and Leonard George was our chief. And that, that just came after the Devil Moose case or whatever case told government and industry to consult with First Nations before stuff happens in their traditional homelands and waters. 
So Chief Leonard gets this invite from Premier Harcourt saying, oh, come join us. We're going to um, acknowledge, we're going to name this park Indian Arm Park. And I don't know, if you know my Uncle Len, you can you know how sneaky he can get. And he laughs, he says, I wonder if I could show up with an injunction. Now, I was on council with him. I said, really? And he laughed. He says, no, but I'll make you sweat. So we contacted the premier's office. He said, hey, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. So what we got from them is a co-management agreement of a provincial park. And it's called Synopsium because it's um, translated, it means serpent slam. Let's see. I believe we have um, a thought I can think of off the top of my head. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think they know enough. They got to double check with us to whether you drop our names anywhere. Because, like you say, people know we're more inclusive. We're willing to work with people than you know buy into that. Well. You know, my grandpa never used that term. He used the term conquer and rule. And you know, when you're sitting at a table with your grandparents, you don't interrupt. So I would always forget at the end of our conversation to say, hey, I think the term is conquer and divide. So what, what it finally I clued into it was, um, you know, when I don't know more was happening here in Vancouver, the Native Ed College asked me to be one of their speakers. So we <clears throat> rallied from their school to City Hall, and I was standing there listening to all the amazing speakers, all our matriarchs were seated in the front row. I happened to look over, and I could, thought I could see a barge. I could see something happening. And then I looked back at the crowd, and it was just amazing, hundreds and hundreds of Indigenous peoples on this lawn. And it sunk in. My grandfather didn't use conquer and divide, he used conquer and rule because we're still here. You know, conquer is to be, um, but he said you, they just try and get you under their thumb, and, but we're still here, so we're, we're still working together. Yeah. Good. Good, I'm good. Oh. Hmm. So, age I am now and thinking back on that, I, I don't want it to come across sounding long, but, you know, I think I was, I was groomed. I remember somebody mentioning that to one of my relatives before, that my grandfather was grooming me for something, maybe that know how we're always told we have gifts, we have strength, and it's up to elders to ensure that the young ones that they're looking out to can groom that. Because we're not all the same. We're, we all can't know the same knowledge. So in, in my own little family, my, my sister and my mom, they've been like the genealogists of our family. If I need to know a connection, I know some, but they can go back even to extended, extended families. So when you're talking, when I'm talking about the name of, I know how we're connected there, but I don't know the families like my mom and my sister do. Um, my youngest sister is, um, really got into weaving. These are, she's an amazing artist. She weaves wool, she does theater. And telling us about all these kind of things that are going through our head, I'm like, oh, man, I'm getting overwhelmed. I can't picture it. Like, she can picture that stuff. And then my brother is a real, you know, sensible business focus. So that's what I see in my family. I don't know if my siblings would agree, but that's what I see. 
And I think we need to do that in our own families, in our own communities, to make sure the path is clear for them to carry on. It's that own, that own reconciling of our own relationships because within our communities, because of the colonizing ways, we've been set against each other like that, those crabs in the bucket. We've been taught to, you know, with the stone was saying, you know, while well, they're doing that over there, what are you guys going to do? Or how come they get to do that and you can't do that? So it's always that playing against each other, which is wrong. It's not how indigenous we need to trust. Right? Thank you.